Hello, welcome everyone and back, welcome back to the next segment of Ars Electronica Home Delivery. My name is Sandra and I'm going to take you on a tour now through our wonderful universe here, right here in our deep space, which I've transformed already, as you can see, into our space shuttle, into our interactive space shuttle. You can already see our beautiful blue marble behind me. I've already started the program called Univiu the tour through the universe. Originally, this program was developed for planetariums to show off our galaxy, our planet, uh, planet system, our solar system and much, much more. And we here at As Electronica thought we could also use this program. And to uh, give you an insight what this program can do, it was originally developed by the company Skisab from Sweden and has now been taken over by Zeiss from Germany. And they provided us with this um, program, but it's not a video, as you would might expect from like a planetarium show. No, this is actually an interactive program where we can actually decide where we want to go. And you see, I'm holding this little smartphone here in my hand. I'm controlling the room with it and also the program Uniview. So what does this mean? It's not a live stream, so it's not, and we don't have cameras actually out there telling us where everything is and how the light and uh, the day and night zone is actually portrayed, but we know it's accurate. As you can see right here, we are hovering over Europe and I can bring us a little bit closer with a tilt of the phone. So we see Europe is still bathed in daylight and we can see the accurate depiction of the day and night line. On the background, we have the cities sh uh, shown brightly here with a problem of our modern times called light pollution. That's actually also a big problem when it comes to stargazing or analyzing uh, our night sky, because when there's too much light here on Earth, then we don't see the stars as we are intended to see them. It's a relatively new problem, so that's been like this for a few decades or just a century. And also, uh, we know that there's much more to see than we can actually make out here from Earth. So that's why we have different perspectives. We have stations on Earth with a uh, task with observing the night sky. And we have satellites, of course, and space telescopes like Hubble, which I will mention later on again. Today's focus is also a little bit on artificial intelligence. So this program it's, uh, in itself is not an AI system, but I can tell you a little bit about AI systems used in space travel, especially with regard to one planet where we're gonna go in a few minutes. So how is this possible, this real-time dynamic data? Well, there are hundreds of terabytes of data necessary to make this program work and interactive. So we have high-speed computers providing this data for us and also uh, for us to be able to access it, we need to have um, the data, of course, itself provided by NASA and ESA. Right, so let's move out a little bit more. We know our little blue marble already, but one thing that you might not be able to see because it's normally invisible, I'm going to show you here in this program. Some of you might already uh, can already guess what this is. It's vital for our survival here on Earth. And as I said before, normally it's invisible. This is the so-called magnetic field of Earth. And it protects us from solar flares and all kinds of radiation from space. So it's a completely natural thing. It's caused by the rotation of Earth's core and it enters and leaves uh, Earth, the planet Earth through the magnetic north and south pole. And without this field, we would have a very tough time living here. You can already see on the left side our life giver, the sun. I already mentioned the solar storms, the solar flares. They can be quite dangerous for us. If we wouldn't have this protective field, the magnetic field, uh, we would be very... Um, prone to attacks, so to say, from solar flares, from those particles that can cause, even with this field, quite a disruption in our electronics. 
They could cause blackouts, for example. And without this magnetic field, life would be almost impossible here on Earth. We are the only planet in our solar system to possess such a field. Especially when it comes to another interesting planet for us, this is a huge difference and will make life much harder if we can ever get there. More on that in a minute. And one would expect that the magnetic field is like a second skin around Earth, more like a second orb. But the solar winds are so strong that it's pushed back almost into the form of a jellyfish or a tear. And you see, it almost touches or sometimes uh, even crosses the red line you see here. And the red orbit is, of course, our constant companion, the moon. We're going to jump there for a second just so that you can have a closer look at our natural satellite. That's how far we've actually been outside of our cosmic doorstep, roughly 380,000 kilometers. It was a huge step for mankind uh, 50 years ago, over 50 years ago now. And since then, we've been up there quite a few times. 12 astronauts have actually set foot on the moon. But since the 70s, no one, no one has been up there. We are not that interested in the moon anymore, at least not visiting it. Analyzing, uh, we still do some sometime. Now, we are much more interested to get to the next planet. You know, Earth is the third planet from the center of our solar system, from the sun, and we want to go to the fourth. And we're gonna jump right there. Astronauts could wish, only wish and dream to do that this quickly. Here we are at Mars. And this, how you also can see that this is not an actual video, of course, and it's completely unrealistic in terms of speed because we can jump around uh, within seconds between vast distances. So Mars is not so named after the Roman god of war because of its bloody color, actually caused by some iron that's found on its surface. And compared to Earth, we can already see there's no water, there's no green, there's no blue. And Mars also does not have a magnetic field as we do and a very different atmosphere, a very thin one. But Mars is nevertheless interesting for us because we think we can survive up there. Scientists have found some resources of a type of water under the poles, so we think we can make it up there. But pack warm and uh, if you like climbing, Mars is your planet because it has bigger cliffs and higher mountains than any other planet in our solar system. For example, you see that's here like bathed in sunlight now. This gorge you see here, this canyon, is roughly the size of North America. So the Grand Canyon can, can go back, pack its bags. And there's a second uh, mountain, but it's a little bit now in darkness, but we can see it, just the tip of it here. This is Olympus Mons, the largest mountain in our entire solar system. It's an inactive volcano and it's three times the size of Mount Everest. So if you like climbing, Mars is the planet for you. And you can still apply for SpaceX, Elon Musk's program, to get there by 2024. But it's a one-way trip. So sometimes we are quite far away from Mars and we have to um, analyze the best way to get there when it's closest to, our, uh, to Earth's orbit. Uh, and the trip back is even more complicated. So there are no humans so far on Mars. But there are machines on Mars, the so-called Mars rovers, and they work with artificial intelligence. As promised before, this is one field where AI can really come in handy. Because artificial intelligence can tell a robot driving around on the surface, stop, wait a second, you might fall down such a huge cliff as we've seen here. If this robot would have a normal communication system with someone here on Earth from NASA telling it to go somewhere, there would be a huge difference from the time the message is sent until the robot receives it. Because depending on how far Mars is away from Earth, the message would take between 10 to 15 minutes to reach the robot. 
much too long in order for it to avoid falling down this cliff. So it's way better to have an artificial intelligence on board telling him stop, wait, maybe turn around so that it can decide for itself what to do. And there's also the plan to use AI in future habitat building, for example, with 3D printing, so that the machines sent up to Mars will then know what to do by themselves. But that's still in the future. We'll see if this is, uh, can be realized. And now I want to leave Mars behind a little bit and also his two companions. Mars does not only have one moon, but two moons. Phobos and Deimos are their names, the Greek names for fear and terror, very fitting to the god of war. And time is running, I want to uh, go a little bit further outside as well, to one of the most well um, known, most recognizable planets, Saturn, here he is. So right now we've left the uh, stone planets from the center of our solar system behind and went out to the gas giants from which is Saturn is the second largest one. Jupiter is the only one bigger in size. But Saturn has surpassed Jupiter in one way now. It has a lot of lines circling it as you can already see it. Those are Saturn's moons from which he now has uh, 82. Jupiter has 79 and was long believed to be the planet with the most moons, but last year 20 new moons joined Saturn's orbit, or we at least we found them, we discovered them, and now he holds the record. The most well-known moon, of course, is Titan. You can see it a little bit here. And uh, we have the different Cassini um, satellites and so um, missions to research this very special moon from Saturn. If we move out a little bit more, the planets will become little dots connected to blue and green lines. Why is that? You might have already guessed it. The green ones are the eight main planets of our solar system. We had nine a few years ago. But Pluto unfortunately lost its status as a planet and instead we invented a new category of planets, the so-called dwarf planets, because Pluto is not uh, bigger than our Earth's moon. And since then we've found several more, one in the asteroid belt very close to the center, Ceres, Pluto and Eris are the three that are in blue here. There are two more. Haumea and Makemake that are not um, put in here so far and there are about 22 more dwarf planets waiting to be recognized as such. So you see our solar system is changing all the time, there are things we uh, have long thought are true, there are things we discover every week and uh, of course it's always in motion. So our entire solar system is in motion and that's the last thing I want to show you. We know the planets circle our sun, but our entire solar system is just one of many. There are various solar systems surrounding us. As you can see the little dots around here, I can show you one example here. So those are the so-called exoplanets. We found planets similar to Earth or to our other planets and they circle their own suns. But mind you, we are still in the same galaxy, we're just talking about different solar systems. And all of this is in a constant state of movement inside our beautiful galaxy, inside our Milky Way. So of course, this is not a selfie now. We don't have a camera that goes that far <laughs> outside, but we can show you some things. We know the galaxy looks like this um, and we also know that our solar system circles the huge supermassive black hole in the middle of our Milky Way and it has been doing so for millions of years and it will hopefully continue to do so because nothing's permanent except movement. And what you see here uh, next to our galaxy are again little colorful dots those are not single planets anymore or solar systems. No, those are other galaxies. And from them we have pictures from the aforementioned Hubble Space Telescope. And it's gonna be bright for a second. 
because the pictures are enlarged so that we can actually make them out. And here we have our neighboring galaxies, the small and large Magellan cloud and Andromeda. But neighbor is a little bit uh, far-fetched because it would take us millions of years to get there with our modern technology. But we can observe them, we can watch them, we can take pictures and discover thousands of new galaxies basically every week. So let's see what more we can discover. Yeah, that's it for my segment today for traveling through the universe with our Uniview program. And I hope you enjoyed the tour. There will be much more to come. And uh, thank you all for joining in. Have a nice afternoon. And maybe tune in tonight for our next segment at um, 7 p.m. where we have a concert from Makina Mikawa and Dennis Russell Davis for you in our second floor music room. Thank you and goodbye.